everyone. Today we're going to talk about a character called Tetsuo Shimabuku. Tetsuo Shimabuku is the founder of Ishinru Karate. He's the martial arts that I currently study and I've studied for, I think, like 25, 26 years now, if my math is correct. We're going to go over his life a little bit and how it perfectly melds with the hero's journey, the heroic myth that is the most powerful thing we have when we understand. It's a great example. And every time you hear one of these stories, it makes your life a little richer and confirms what you already know. So just a brief background of Tetsuo Shimabuku. He uh, grew up in Okinawa. That's where Ishinru is from. It's where he is from. When he was a younger child, he was going to be a fortune teller. That's what his parents wanted him to do. A little background about the Okinawan spiritual life. In their practice, only the women could be the priests. Now, this is old school. Modern day things have obviously changed. But the females were like the priests. They were in charge of spiritual issues. The males could only be either escorts, like guards, or they could study like the stars. And so Tetsuo Shimabuku read the I Ching. The I Ching is very deep in Chinese philosophy. I do have a copy of it and I do want to read it. I haven't got a chance to read it just yet. And I want to go through the Ishinru code that he came out with because I believe there's a lot to be gleaned from that, a lot to be gleaned in character. But I feel I need to read the I Ching to get a better understanding of it. Now I'm going to be going by probably the English translation of the Ishinru code eventually. So if I know there's some discussion about how the translation has wavered throughout the years. So if you could point me to something that's a little bit more truthful down below in the comments, I would definitely appreciate that. But there was a point in Shimabuku's life where he did not want to be a fortune teller anymore, I believe, while he was being taught how to be just that. He started taking martial arts from his uncle, and he really became basically obsessed with it. And throughout the course of his life, that is what he kind of threw himself into. He had three masters of renown. Uh, you might, you probably heard of the one, but not the other two. The first one was Chutuku Kion. Then he had Choki Motobu, and then he had Chojin Miyagi. And he's probably exactly who you think he is. So Tutuku Kion is a very worldly man, but he also gave away a lot of himself. He, he said, experience all of life as if you're doing it with karate. He would say, challenge yourself and then go to brothels. And he would cheat on his wife sometimes, but he also gave away a lot of his food. I believe he died of emaciation after giving his food away. I think, I think that's how he went. So this was back in the time where before there was rank, before there was like belts and report cards to see who was the best and world championships, that kind of thing. This was a time when the way you know someone is a good fighter, it's either by reputation or directly challenging. So it'd be like, yo, you see that guy over there? What, that really short guy? Yeah, don't mess with him. He'll destroy you. You know, that kind of thing. And there's stories about Chutuku Kion. He's, I think the name means small-eyed Chan, something like that. Or that, maybe that was the name of it, Tetsuo Shimabuku's first martial arts or something like that. Small, because he was small and he had tiny eyes. He had thick glasses too. But he was renowned. He got into fights and won. There's several stories. I love. One of my favorite ones is when he was 60, he was challenged by a 40-year-old police officer that was like a chief of police, and he beat that guy. And he would always do his demonstrations himself him up into his 70s. Very renowned fighter, and he, he, won a, a, he beat a lot of bigger opponents. The second one is Choki Motobu. Now, Choki Motobu comes from the higher caste of the Okinawans, so he would like royal privilege before the Japanese came in and like took all that away. And what Choki Motobu would do is he would test his karate out by walking down like the red light district and challenging like punks to fights and see what would work and so see what wouldn't work his method of fighting was brutal and effective and i believe he lays claim that he never lost a fight after the age of 25 something like that and there's a lot more you can look into when it comes to choki motobu he was a very uncultured man he only knew one language usually everybody branched out and learned a bit more i believe he was illiterate too but that might be hearsay. I'm not sure about that part. He did write a book, but maybe someone else dictated it for him. I don't know. Correct me. Set me straight. I'm here to learn. And the last one is Chojin Miyagi. Now, the name Miyagi might sound familiar because that is the person who the Karate Kid's master, the original one in the 80s, is based off of. This guy was hardcore. He taught philosophy, and he taught, he taught Gojuru. So Gojuru is mostly like a grappling style. I believe Shonru was taught by Motobu and Chutuku Kion because that's what converged and eventually made Ishinru. Chojin Miyagi would teach philosophy on one hand and then his own personal workouts were so hard he would pass out from them. Like that's how hardcore this guy was and I kind of, I really like, that's my template right there. Philosophy, martial arts mixed together. I think that sounds like a pretty good light. At least I'll find out, I guess. So those are the three people that Tetsuo learned from and Tetsuo was a very... He was also roughly philosophical and spiritual, and he had a dream one night. One of the, the dream was he fell asleep after training in his 
courtyard. He woke up and he was, I think he was working. I'm not sure. And then a man came through the gate and Shimab and he challenged the master to a fight. And Shimabuku put his hand out saying, I don't want to fight you, but I will if I have to. And the man laughed, disappeared, turned into fire all around him. And instead of panicking, Tetsuo took water from like the drinking trough and put out the fire, and then he woke up. That's significant for a lot of reasons. We can dive into dreams and their meanings for a bit. The reason why that was significant to him, and maybe this can resonate with you as well, is that I think the next day he was on a business trip to Naha, and he saw a symbol of a water goddess with in the same exact hand posture that he was. So something about a dream template that you see evidenced in, in reality, like that's got a call to you, man. And he knew better than to just ignore that and, and throw it away. Like that's something significant. So he took that and he told his students and one of his students, I, be, I believe, Avencula, I think his name is, made a patch for him. The guy's still alive today. And that's what the Ishinru patch represents. It's Mitsugami. And I think Mitsugami is actually a, I looked into this a little bit. It's actually a male Shinto god as opposed to a female. So that kind of stuff gets gets a little wonky and I'm not sure exactly where that lure gets switched. Um, but I knew, I do know in the realms of it, the Okinawan deities have more of a female presence and in the Japanese ones, they have more of a male presence by far. There's a, there's a distinct difference there between the two. So Shimabuku was a very capable man, a very experienced man. Now, the reason why Ishinru came over here to America, I think, was because of one event. And it's an important event. So all the here, here's the scenario. There were Marines that were occupying part of Okinawa. It's close to Japan. It's close to a lot of areas around the Asian area that we want to keep an eye on, put it that way. And the Marines were looking for a place to train, and they had a lot of dojos to choose from. So what they decided on was Ishinru Karate. Now, why did they decide on Ishinru Karate? Well, there's a lot of stories and a lot of hearsay. They didn't record a whole lot back then. But the, the story that rhymes everywhere and like everywhere you look is the story about the demonstration he did in front of the Marines. The demonstration went something like this. He lined up a bunch of nails in a two by four and pounded them all through with his hand or with his fist rather. He pounded them in with his fist. It's specific on the fist from the accounts I read. And with his heel, he could do this too. But something happened during the demonstration. That something was he missed. He missed with a part of his hand, I guess that was toughened, cut himself pretty bad, picked up some dirt, put it on the cut, and then continued the demonstration. I think that event right there is what basically led to Ishinru populating itself in America. Because I think I believe in Okinawa there's only like three dojos there. In America there's like over a thousand. There's there's so many there's a big representation of Ishinru over here in America in comparison to Okinawa. Now why is that? I think it's because it resonates with very much what's imprinted on us, specifically in the West, the concept of you start at normal, okay, his, his comfort zone is martial arts, so, and this demonstration is something you could do, but he hit the unknown, the unknown actually tore him up, it cut his hand, Be because he decided to continue with the demonstration he himself was doing, just put some dirt on it, and then go back to normal, because he went through the pain that we all can understand. He was looked at with renown by the Marines because they're like, this guy overcame adversity hardcore. Perfection's one thing, but that's like an, something you can never really achieve. But overcoming imperfection, that's something that every single person can relate to. And I think that's how Shimabuku hooked all the Marines into wanting to do his martial art. I think it's really fascinating. Because of that one event, Ishinru spread over here in America. And you and I, we had these events happen to us. We set ourselves up for them sometimes. Sometimes they just fall into our lap. One example, I was talking to a guy the other day. He he has a choice in his life. So he, he had a couple DUIs and he lost his license and blacked out. And he just got his license back. But now he has the opportunity as a chance. He's been saving up money. He can choose to either spend some money right now, buy a junker car, or go get a loan and start a car payment to build his credit up. Now... The shortcut answer to that is obviously buy the junker car. That's what you want to do. But do you really want to do that? How high are you aiming? How high do you want to bounce back? Because if you have that high car, that'll give you incentive to work harder maybe to get it. Or what do you want to look like? What kind of image do you want to present? And are you going to live up to that image? But then again, the junker car could also be a stepping stone. But that's one of those points in your life, right? You think it's a small decision, but it's actually a really big one depending upon your aim. I think that's why they they described man's fault as sin, sin in, in the scriptures, because sin means to miss the mark, because you're not aiming properly. You're either not aiming properly and with the skill set, or you're not aiming at the right target. Difficulty, it's something you don't even aim at.
Another thing I find fascinating is that Tetsuo named it Ishinru. Ishinru means one heart way. Some of his students asked him, that's such a silly name, why would you name it that? And he said, because all things begin with one. And I kind of like that concept. I like the, the concept of the martial arts dojo, and I like the concept of Ishinru itself with the name, because when you're in a dojo, you're learning how to perfect violence. That's really what you're doing. You're learning how to deal with chaos that would be a fight, because fighting is chaotic. And what you do in karate is you practice. You practice like block, punch, block, punch. Or you, pla you practice your moves to hone them and get better at them. Because when the chaos comes, you go with the familiar. Everybody does this. So when the chaos comes, someone swings at your head. You've been practicing this move set so many times, it just comes naturally to you. Don't even have, it's, it's like faster than thought. And that's the idea behind karate, cat butt, is that you want to re you want the familiar to come back to you sooner rather than later. The other reason I like the dojo scene is because of the respect that's involved as well. You are one person. You're not a person, different person in the dojo than you are when you're out of the dojo. You're one person through and through. And so it teaches you character, it teaches you etiquette, and teaches you respect. At least it should. A proper dojo should do this. And when it starts losing its a little bit of its rigidity, a little bit of its yes sir, no sir, well, it kind of flops all around. It, it doesn't, the structure, the whole structure it gets lost. I don't want to make him sweat too much. They might leave my dojo. I don't want to make him hurt too much. They might, the whole point is you're, you're, you're supposed to be tempering people. I would say men specifically to be harder to make sure they can fight that adversity as time goes on. Anyway, I just wanted to enlighten you a little bit about Tetsuo Shimabuku and the martial arts that I've been taking for a while. The, the K in BKD does stand for karate, so I should address that a bit more, and we will more so in the future. If you want to hear more stories like this and other examples of how we can take mythic things that appeal to us, subscribe below. I really appreciate it. It helped me out a lot. And I'll see you next time. Take care.